Hi, and welcome to another video for Friday the 13th, the game. Today I will be reflecting on the gameplay of the F-13 game from its initial release to its Rage Mode patch. This is not a documentary on the game's development, but rather a summary of its timeline from May of 2017 to present. Though the foundations of the game have remained the same, there have been many changes to its format over time. There may not be any further DLCs to enhance the game, and balance has always been an issue, but has Gun Media finally got it right? Well, let's look back at when the game was first released and reflect on the initial mold that was presented at launch. Cast your mind back to a time when there were only 10 counselors and not all of the variants of Jason were available. Crystal Lake, Pakanak, and Higgins Haven were the only backdrops from the film franchise, online play was the player's sole option, and the game was only available digitally. The boundaries and the objectives of the game have never changed. Jason's motivation has always been to kill all of his opposition inside of 20 minutes, and the counselor's goal has always been to survive by means of escape. Vehicles were provided and required preparation before use, the foam point first needed to be repaired before the police could be called, and cabin drawers had to be searched in order for a counselor to attain the items needed to increase their chances of survival. However, in spite of the game's unchanging foundation, the favor of success weighed heavily towards Jason Voorhees. The extent of Jason's grab was nothing less than OP. Getting into a window before Jason could get hold of you was difficult to say the least, and furniture was only an obstacle to the counselor. If that wasn't hard enough, items found by counselors were not highlighted. One had to hope that a fellow player had managed to drop off the battery ahead of the car if they were unable to fit it. Should Jason chase and kill a counselor out in the far reaches of the map, the location of the phone fuse would remain a mystery unless another player had stumbled on the body of the hapless victim. Verbal communication was thus essential. Tommy wasn't much help either. He didn't start the game with a pocket knife or a medispray, and by the time he joined the fray, all of the drawers had been looted. He was merely an extra counselor for Jason to kill before the conclusion of the game. Nevertheless, the game had a fearful atmosphere. The in-game music added to the tension and jump scares were aplenty. This kept players yearning for more in spite of the game's biggest downfall. Rage quitting. Dedicated servers had not been implemented when the game was released, thus the lobby was dependent on a single player to host a match. If the host was among the first to die at the hands of our favorite serial killer, the host would often leave the game, ending the match for all involved. This also applied to players using Jason, but as Jason was so OP, this was rarely the case. Though DLCs had yet to be introduced, players who had helped fund the game's release were rewarded with a new playable form of Jason that had never featured in any of the films the game was based on. The resurrected serial killer had emerged from Satan's Palace and was designed by the franchise's special effects designer, Tom Savini. Savini Jason was armed with the Devil's Pitchfork and had all the desirable attributes to make him the culmination of all of his previous forms. To this day, only those initial backers are able to use this Jason, and to some that remains a sore point for those who had purchased the game after release. The first DLC to be introduced by Gun Media came in the form of a new skin for Jason Part 3. The third incarnation of the killer was given a purple makeover, which played homage to the 1989 Nintendo version of the game. This was a free update available to all players, and the colorful murderer also came with an 80s gaming accompanying score. Two further DLCs shortly followed that could be purchased through the online store. Your 10 counselors could now be clothed in swimwear from the 1984 swim pack, 
and an additional set of emotes could be implemented to give the, a whole new set of dance moves to celebrate your impending escape. However, the first big DLC to be implemented to the game came in October of 2017. Players got a new map, the Jarvis Residence. The map was much larger than the previous playable landscapes and was aesthetically pleasing with two very well designed main houses from part 4's The Final Chapter. Better still was the introduction of a new playable Jason. Part 4 was equipped with a pig splitter and was a formidable killer and had arguably the best kill animations of his variants. You could also purchase three additional animations via the store for part 4 Jason's own kill pack. If that wasn't enough, Gun Media also introduced another skin pack for the 10 original counselors. This was also available to buy in store, and you could now dress your ill-fated character in their own costume to commemorate Hollow's Eve. Shortly thereafter, a new counselor was introduced in the form of a hippie stoner by the name of Mitch Floyd. Mitch had a striking resemblance to the character of Chuck from the third film in the franchise. The game also became available as a hard copy disc for PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and PC. Gun Media also made a patch to affect the balance of the game at this time. Key items that were dropped were now highlighted on the map. Jason's grab reach was nerfed, and Tommy Jarvis came equipped with a pocket knife and medispray. The balance shifted in favor of the counselor. Jason Part 7 suffered the most from the update, and with a more effective Tommy, the secret was soon out. Skilled counselors were able to slay the giant in cooperation of a female counselor wearing Pamela's sweater. Yet another new playable counselor from the third film in the franchise was introduced, the lovable biker Fox. Players were enjoying the regularity of new content, and this point was probably the peak of the game's popularity. By late November, a new patch was implemented which further tipped the balance in the favour of the counsellor. Additional items could be found around the campsite and were not just limited to the cabin drawers. This was the period in the game which I like to refer to as the pocket knife era. With more pocket knives available, Jason's ability to kill his opposition was seriously hampered. It was incredibly frustrating to be the once formidable serial killer, and thus Jason player rage quitting was becoming more frequent. Jason players were dying at an alarming rate. Jason had to slash in order to be effective, and the confidence of having so many pocket knives soon narrowed the selection choice of characters who could effectively fight back. Battle chads were abundant. Teabagging and dance taunting was happening in every game. The tables had turned, and Jason, in some instances, was the victim. Gun Media did eventually address the issue, but the pocket knife era lasted for close to two months. During this time, other DLCs were introduced. In early December, yet another counselor was added from the third film in the franchise. Sheldon Finkelstein. What was particularly good about this character's introduction was the fact that he was voiced by the original actor from the film, Larry Zerner. However, just before Christmas of 2017, Gun Media introduced its largest DLC to date, an update that allowed players to not only play online, but also offline. The first option was very much like its online counterpart, with the exception that you could only play as Jason. Offline bots was simply a means for honing one's skills against a random selection of AI counselors. The opposition weren't particularly bright. Seek and destroy kills happened as often as other forms of death, and standing in one place was a common occurrence. But on, on the plus side, players could now play as the homicidal behemoth without the worry of host rage quitting. The second offline experience was that of the virtual cabin. It was like a cryptic website which invited players to learn about the history behind the film franchise through a series of puzzles. 
It didn't offer much in the way of replayability, but what it did offer was an insight into future content that Gun Media had in the works. In the months leading up to the December DLC, Gun Media had presented its fan base with a map that would plot a timeline of future content. Players could speculate on what would come next, but the virtual cabin presented them with a visual that was more concrete. On successfully completing all of the stages of the virtual experience, players were teased with the announcement of a new Jason and an accompanying map. Apparently, Jason X would be making an appearance in the coming new year, along with a map that was no longer restricted to a campsite. All of these December editions were free to Friday gamers, with the only exception being a new purchasable kill pack made exclusively for Jason Part 7. Like Jason Part 4, the new Blood Killer was given three new kill animations to satisfy his murderous yearnings. Come the turn of the new year, the developers kept to their promise of a new map and a new Jason but not the X-themed DLC players had been expecting. Instead, Pinehurst and Roy Burns were the feature of the game year's new beginning. It was a pleasant surprise, and like the Jarvis residence before it, Pinehurst was aesthetically pleasing. The map was huge and offered three escape points for both the car and the boat instead of the usual two. However, its size played to Jason's advantage in every way. Items required to ready vehicles were scattered widely across the map, and the drive to safety was no easy task. In spite of its size, there were few map-specific hiding spots, and the trek between cabins was vast. Pinehurst thus garnered the nickname Pine Worst, but was a faithful representation and thus was a welcome addition to the game. The new playable killer, on the other hand, was surprisingly better than anyone could have anticipated. Equipped with garden shears and wearing blue overalls, Roy Burns was a lethal predator. His grip strength and damage resistance may not have been the best, but his stock ability and shift were a force to be reckoned with. He also benefited from not being a part of the pocket knife era. Gun Media by this time had reduced the number of pocket knives and medi sprays to re-establish balance, though Tommy remained the same. Admittedly, the teabagging and dance taunting reduced, but the team bashing adjacent continued, and thus rage quitting was still very much a problem. Though the developers insisted that there would be new content in the future, the developers stated that they would turn their focus towards dedicated servers, and thus Jason X was put on the back burner. As it would be some time before dedicated servers could be implemented, the developers created the salt mines in an attempt to discourage rage quitting. Players who elected to leave the game early would be punished by having reduced priority when waiting in a lobby. The scheme didn't work, and thus rage quitting continued. Unbeknown to fans at the time, big changes were on the horizon. In hindsight, the March DLC seemed like a sweetener before the fall. Single player challenges were added to offline play ahead of the game's first anniversary. Players could reenact scenes from the film franchise with their choice of Jason. The reward for completing each challenge was an emote for your counselors, which this time came free of charge. The challenges themselves were highly enjoyable, but it was like the virtual cabin. On completion, there wasn't much reason to revisit them. Another addition to the game was weapon swapping. Now Jason could use any of the weapons available to his other variants. Part 2 could use the shears. Roy could wield an axe. Part 6 could be equipped with the machete, and so forth. However, players had to be of a higher level than 111 to have this ability, and thus many a novice host would leave the game knowing they were facing an inexperienced Jason. 
A new counselor was also added to the game by the name of Victoria Sterling. Victoria had a striking resemblance to a Friday character of the th seventh film, Melissa. Her presence evened up the number of female characters to male, and sadly she would be the final counselor to be added to the game. Jason also received one last update in the form of a new kill pack for Part 2. Weapon swapping had come into effect by this point, but for players under the level of 111, the kill pack was exclusive to Part 2 when purchased from the online store. Dedicated servers were ushered in and enhanced the game immensely. Now players weren't dependent on the host remaining in the game. Rage quitting was no longer an issue and thus the time spent in the waiting lobby was acceptable. It was the addition players had been calling for since the time of the game's launch, and it was an instant improvement to gameplay. Unfortunately, dedicated servers and uninterrupted gameplay couldn't sweeten the sour taste of the pill fans were forced to swallow only a few days after the DLC's release. On June 11, 2018, Gun Media announced that due to a legal dispute between the film series creator Sean S. Cunningham and its original scriptwriter Victor Miller, no further content would be added to the game for the foreseeable future. This meant that Jason X and his accompanying map would never be introduced, along with any other plans the developers had included, like kill packs, emotes, clothing, and new counselors. By all effects, the game was dead. The court ruling was months away, and then there was the matter of a possible appeal. The court ruled in favor of scriptwriter Victor Miller, and though Cunningham retained the title of Friday the 13th, Miller had the rights to its characters, including Jason Voorhees. Gun Media were permitted to work on bug fixes and other online game maintenance, so the game continued as was. Ilphonic cut its ties with its development partner and Gun Media began work on a new project. However, Gun Media did continue to work on the playability of the game for the coming months, which included Jason's new Rage Mode enhancement. Now stunning Jason would be next to impossible once the hulking killer had entered Rage. Baseball bats, flare guns, and other weapons were only now effective if Jason had hold of one of your fellow counselors. Alone, all weapons were useless, apart from the rifle. In spite of no further development, the game continues, and strangely, the playability and balance seem to be the best it has ever been. Jason has regained his menacing stature, but counselors still have the means to escape, and the killer isn't so OP that he can't be slain. Though the lawsuit had damaged the game's development irreversibly, the game has managed to retain its legacy, and though somewhat diminished, its fan base has remained. The game is, and forever will be, a faithful homage to an amazing film franchise, and can be enjoyed by new and old fans alike in the coming months and beyond. Well, that concludes this reflective outlook on F-13's timeline. I hope you found this video to be both entertaining and informative. Let me know in the comments section if there's something that I missed or didn't detail. In the meantime, check out our channel for more Friday the 13th The Game content. Until then, take care and have a good day.